All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode. That's right, the London is Blue podcast, hopefully your favorite Chelsea podcast out there, and a part of the Men in Blazers media network. No Brandon today, but you got myself, Dan, joined by Nick. And look, the vibes are real good after Chelsea dominated, destroyed, demolished, whatever other D adjective you would like to use, Nick. But it was certainly a delight for Chelsea supporters to roll up and see Sean Dyche and Everton rolled for six goals at Stamford Bridge. And I know sometimes you get labeled as the optimist on this show. And I just want to give you an opportunity to spread that positivity that you're known for right now. Well, I, I think it's just worth saying up top that this is the first El Blaze Erico that we've been a part of as the Men in Blazers Men in Blazers Media Network. And uh, Raj, we took no pleasure in this whatsoever. Just n- nothing personal. We took no pleasure in it whatsoever. And uh, yeah, you know what? For the first time in a long time, we're actually going to have some fun with this and and spread some joy because you know we were talking before the uh, before the show. We deserve this. (laughs) We deserve this little moment in the sun where we played well, we didn't give up any goals, and we have a bona fide superstar on our team. And uh, it's going to be a fun one. It is indeed. We're going to get into just how electric Cole Palmer is, talk a little bit about the supporting cast around him on the night, players like Nico Jackson, Gallagher, absolutely captain performance to a T, And then also celebrate one Alfie Gilchrist having a big, big cameo appearance on the day and look into is the European dream still slightly alive? Look, it's not a major flame, but there is still a flame on the wick of that candle. And until it goes out completely, we're going to try to prognosticate the best that we can. But Nick, for those who can't recall, who didn't watch the match fully or haven't watched it back the third, fourth or fifth time yet, because it's a good match. You might want to do that. Why don't you run us through some three-word match reviews to get the people ready and to set the stage for the conversation? The vibes were vibing, as one as one might say. Uh, Jordan Chiachi with We're Not Worthy. We're not worthy. Uh, Matt Fitz with Cole Keeps Burning. Like that. Mr. Thurman with Cole Den Boot Incoming. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Craig Ledoux with A Perfect Signing. Damian Marshall with Being Ice Cole. And that uh, comes with an outcast gift. So you, my friend, are good with me. Uh, Spanish Joe with Gilchrist's gleeful goal. Uh, Raf uh, with Alfie's from Cobham. Telfer McGraw with fans deserve this. Absolutely. And Dan Dormer. What are these yours? Well, why not six? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm, I can't, can't go. Why not us? Because that's just uh, inappropriate. That it doesn't it doesn't take into account the context of the situation. But why not six? That could happen. Well, Dan, if we would have beat two lower uh, table teams in the last week, we would be sixth right now, and that's just a fact in math points. So uh, I went with uh, recently. Everton had another points deduction. My three word match view is Palmer's points destruction. So. <sighs> How, how boot that? That is quite on the nose. You might be getting a little bit of a points deduction from the Premier League yourself for that one. <laughs> we'll clear the admin out of the way just so we get to the actual match conversation. Thank you so much for everybody leaves five-star reviews and Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Always appreciate it. it. helps people find the show. Huge thank you to those who are also jumping on the YouTube bandwagon and getting involved. People who are subscribing, liking, and commenting on the videos and also hitting the bell icon to get notified. You are true heroes. And we also appreciate those who've signed up for our wonderful free weekly newsletter penned by Sam, CFC Central, the London is Blue Dispatch, and those who have joined the conversation as part of our Discord community. There's a free and paid version. Whichever one you want to choose, you're more than welcome. But look, it was Everton this past Monday, April 15th, tax day. And boy, oh boy, <laughs> the IRS came for Everton and collected. Uh, uh, it was ever. at Stanford Bridge. It was Chelsea 6, Everton nil. Cole Palmer with four of the goals, 13th, 18th, 29th, and 64th minute. Nico Jackson got involved in the 44th minute, and Alfie Gilchrist in the 90th minute sealed the fate of Everton in this one. But, Nick, why don't you run us through the lineup? We know that Mauricio Pochettino did not have a full complement available, so there were some 
new names on the bench too. Yeah, we found out uh, pre-match that Axel De Sassi, one of the very few healthy players for the entire season, uh, had a little bit of an injury, was likely to miss this one, along with Enzo Fernandez, a midfielder who uh, we typically do not play without. And so yeah, it was very, it was going to be interesting heading into this, see who actually played and who didn't. Uh, Georgi Petrovic back in between the sticks had very little to do today. Um, so he got, got his clean sheet and he's out the door. That's good. Malo Gusto comes back in. Trev Chalaba on the right. Tiago Silva on the left. Mark Kukurea as left back with Connor Gallagher and Moises Caicedo uh, as the midfield pivot. Mikhailo Mudrik, Cole Palmer, Noni Matueke, and Nicholas Jackson made up the starting attack. Uh, subs of Carney Chokomeka, Ben Chilwell, first appearance in month and a half, I think, something like that, since March. Uh, Cesare Cassidy, Alfie Gilchrist, who we will talk about, of course, and David Washington, unused subs, Bettinelli, Benoit Batishiel, Keanu Dyer, and Tyreek George. Uh, would have liked to see them, but uh, but we didn't, and I have a, a little commentary on that later. Well, let's look at all the top-line stats, too. You would imagine the XG would have been higher, but only 2.96 to Chelsea, 1.14 to Everton. You had 59% of the possession to 41% for the Toffees. 14 total shots, 10 on target to their 10 with 2 on target. And look, when you kind of take it into account for big chances, one of our favorite stats, Chelsea had six of them, only missed two. Everton had one and missed their one opportunity. I love this random stat, Nick. I know you're going to enjoy this random stat I found, too. Opta sure. Joe, one. Sean Dyche tonight suffered the heaviest defeat of his managerial career in what it was his 531st game in charge across spells with Watford, Burnley, and Everton. Thumped. Yeah, and uh, as a as a team who's played Sean Dyche's Burnley and now Sean Dyche's Everton, uh, couldn't happen to a better guy, you know. And uh, we're we're excited about this. Look, I think Sean Dyche is actually a pretty nice dude. I have no problem with him. I hate his football, and I'm glad we gave it to him large today. That was nice. Look, if you have not seen it before, he has a lovely three minute, four minute video of him talking to some radio presenters in the UK and that one of the radio presenters brought in Indian food, like their partner had made the Indian food and you get Sean Dyche's commentary on Indian food for three, four minutes, which is great. Love that. Like you, Nick, I don't enjoy playing his teams. And so this one, this one random stat I really enjoy, but I know the people are what they're really waiting for is their end pet shithouse moment of the match. And I feel like in a six nil win, you have a lot of options to pull from. I do, uh, but this one's a bit of an own goal, Dan, because our shithouse moment of the match was against ourselves. That's right, our own players, uh, which we will talk about later in great detail, fighting amongst themselves for a penalty, shoving each other, causing all sorts of a fracas and ruckus and all sorts of nonsense. So um, not typical for a, a battering like this, but uh, yeah, tough, tough stuff was a tough beat for the Blues in that moment. But look, we're going to get that ad break out of the way. We're back. It is all about the OMG WTF, how Chelsea got it done, and a special night at Sanford Bridge. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. All right, Nick. Cole Palmer, I think at the top, is just where we have to start because the kid was, again, give a little Manchester reference here, electric. Oasis for you and continued to absolutely dominate on the night. Another 10 out of 10 on sofa score. We looked through some of the stats there only played 80 minutes, but he had 50 touches, four goals, five shots, five on target. He accounted for 2.27 of our total XG 22 out of 27 accurate passes, three out of four successful dribbles. And just there's a litany of fun stats that we're going to get into. But I mean, I think you called it at the top. He's quickly becoming world-class. He is world-class. Where do we want to land on that? He's world-class. Did you see the first call? <laughs> I mean, nutmeg back heel shot after a pass from Jackson, which was also very nicely laid off. The kid's just doing it right now. I mean, there's nothing. And he is a kid. He's 21. I mean, it's, it's actually insane what we're seeing. It's like, I didn't think that we would that, you know, we'd be in a position where he got 10 goals this year, let alone 20 in the Premier League. I mean, he has 20 in the Premier League. Dan, 
there's still seven matches to play. S- six matches in the league. I mean, this is this is ridiculous, man. Like I the skill is is undeniable, but it's also like the the third goal, the closing down of space. You know, like a Naz and I disagree on his pressing ability and, and things like that. And I think that's okay. You know, I don't, I don't mind a disagreement about that. He doesn't press like a crazy person. He presses space. He wants to make the space go away. So he pressed the space. Pickford thinks, oh, there's no way he's going to extend a leg and get this ball, pass it right to him, chips him for a goal. That's not a goal that's born out of laziness. That's, that's a goal that's born out of hard work and just understanding situational football. He's incredibly intelligent. He's incredibly skillful, and he is absolutely world class. And if for whatever reason Gareth Southgate doesn't take him to the Euros, which is still a rumor that he might not make it, what are you doing? <laughs> not like I want him to play more international football. I want him to get nice and rested before he goes on a Ballon d'Or hunt next year. But like, he's unbelievable, Dan. Unbelievable. All right, so I'll hit you with two of the stats that I really enjoyed on a special night for Cole Palmer. He has now scored the fastest perfect hat trick in Premier League history. 13th minute was the left foot. 18th minute was the header, which was really well done. Good composure in there. Good ability to get up. And then the 29th minute, the right foot, right foot wonder goal. Just his ability to chip it over the top. A lot of, a lot of swivel on that ball. Real, real nice the way that he got that in there. Other one was four. It's off to Joe. Tonight, Cole Palmer, 21 years old, 345 days. That's right. The lad is going to be turning 22 very soon. Became the fifth youngest player to score four-plus goals in a single Premier League game and the first Chelsea player to net four-plus times in a single league match since Frank Lampard against Aston Villa in March of 2010. Souvenir. Real good. Remind me, was Frank Lampard pretty good? I, I don't, I don't remember that far away, but it seemed to be like he was some sort of legend, right? He's in fantastic company. We should say that yeah. fantastic company for huh. Cole Palmer to be. And if you're in a stat collection with Didier Drogba, with Frank Lampard, you're in very good company. Particularly when you're also not the recognized striker for the team. I mean, when you look at Cole's heat map, most of his activity came from outside the box today, came from in and around the top of it, and he's making things happen. Like He doesn't need to spend a lot of time getting into the box. The movement around it, the way he's interchanging with other players on the pitch, I really love how he's developed that partnership with Malo Gusto. Like he is... They are very connected. It's almost like that uh, Pacific Rim Kaiju experience. Like they're just connected in the automaton together and guiding play. It's really, really good to watch. I got one for your not sci-fi nerds out there. Um, <laughs> okay. There should just be whatever your fast food joint of, of preference is, whatever your favorite sauce should just be renamed our right side because Gusto, pure sauce, Cole Palmer, pure sauce. Uh, maybe you get two different sauces. Maybe you mix them together. Maybe it becomes one great sauce. Who knows? But it is, it's dynamic as hell is what it is. I mean, it is unbelievable. You know, Gusto has obviously come on so strong this year. Cole Palmer has been outstanding. If we can get the left side to do what the right side is doing, be in some, uh, some interesting shape. I'll tell you that. Nick, you also threw a stat in here just about the number of Premier League goals since the start of March for Cole Palmer versus Liverpool. I think you enjoyed this one in particular. Look, a little bit of context here. We had one of the few very good weekends, results weekends we've had in some time. Arsenal lose, Liverpool lose, Spurs lose. That's a pretty great weekend. Then Chelsea bamboozle Everton 6-0. This, this weekend has lifted me. It's made me feel joy for the first time in a long time. Uh, Duncan Alexander, not notoriously a fan of Chelsea Football Club, let's put that out there, uh, said PL goals since the start of March, Cole Palmer 10, Liverpool 9. The wheels have fallen off, my friend, and uh, it's wonderful to see. I mean, look, just to cover off on Cole before we move on to silliness uh, that we'll talk about here in a second. You take, you know, like just 
outside of, of some of the more drab performances I'm thinking about, the uh, forest away in the in the Carabao Cup where he misses three chances, should have had a hat trick in that game. He's rarely below a seven out of ten. Rarely. And like if you think about where this team needs to go, all these young pieces trying to coalesce and and make something that's greater than their individual parts. The individual parts are what we're going to talk about next, obviously. Uh if if other players can lift their floor. Europe, proper Europe, is in sight. But we have so many performances that are fours and fives for a floor where his is always a seven or above. Rarely does it dip down to a six. Rarely does he have one of those off games where he's not a productive member of the team or working with other players to find something. Like, that is the model. You know, I think the commentary said that. I think Andy Townsend was on the commentary uh, today on NBC with uh, with Martin Tyler, that is the challenge for the rest of this team, for the young guys to go, ah, if I could do it like that, if I can be a part of the team like that, if I can lift my floor, we're all having a much better time. And I think, you know, for, for whatever reason, this this 21-year-old has, I think over the last month and a half, really started to become a leader in this team. Like, obviously, he knows he's the man. Being the man and being a leader are two different things. But I think he's showing real leadership. And that is something incredibly special. Not something that I thought we would get for 42 million pounds or whatever. Definitely not. Let's jump in to the silliness. because You mentioned it as your impact shit house moment of the match. There was the moment after the penalty was awarded that we saw another moment of players not agreeing on who should get the take. We saw Madueke being interested. We saw Nico Jackson being interested. Connor Gallagher has to come in and sort of officiate the situation as the captain. Cole Palmer gets gets up in there and wants to take it. Just really interesting scenes. And I think the context we want to provide now, because at the moment, as we're all reacting to it, we're thinking about the coats that Pochettino had in prior weeks where he's talked about the fact that there is not an anointed player on the team that he entrusts the players that he leaves it up to him. And so we got commentary after the match. I'm going to talk about Cole's comments here first, and then we'll get to Pochettino Cole afterwards was interviewed by most outlets and the quote that filtered around when he asked, asked about like, Hey, what's, what's going on with the penalty? He's like, I'm the penalty taker. I want to take it. So I took it. Everybody has responsibility. And we ended up laughing about it and joking about it. And the manager has spoken to us about it now. Q Poch's comments says, hey, post-match, he's told the squad that Cole Palmer is now the official penalty taker. And he said, it's a shame. I told the players in the dressing room we cannot behave this way. I told them that this is the last time I'll accept this type of behavior. This is not a joke. It's impossible after a performance like this to see this type of behavior. If we want to be a great team fighting for big things, we need to think more in a collective way. I made clear to them, and now through the media, and I say to our fans, Cole Palmer is the penalty taker, and it's now his choice if he wants to give the ball to another player. So now that we have the benefit of the new context, of outside the moment, Nick, we could talk about what happened on the pitch, how this maybe shouldn't have been resolved sooner than that, and what we do going forward. Well, he also mentioned that um, he would take players off if it happened again. Like, you'd be yanked. <laughs> and I think that that is the greatest threat that that someone like him could provide. This situation is entirely Apache's making, though. Like, let's just not forget that. It, he could have easily come out four months ago and said, Cole Palmer's the penalty taker. And, and he wouldn't need to say that to the press. Cole Palmer just would have been unabated to the penalty spot. <laughs> there, there just wouldn't have been a conversation about it, right? And and this is the way it should be, man. Like, we're winning 4-0 or 3-0 at this point. No, it's 4-0. We were winning 4-0 at this point. This is the fifth goal. The squad is playing excellent football, tremendous football. The game is, Stanford Bridge is buzzing. There's tons of songs being sung. It's a joyful atmosphere. Cole Palmer gets fouled. For the penalty, they they clarified on the broadcast it was the, it was the foul on him that was the penalty, not the foul on Mataweke. Although 
I don't know. I thought both of them are pretty egregious. And there's a fight between two guys who aren't the penalty taker. What are you guys doing? And then the sulking after the, the conversations after the bullshit after like the fact that it took Malagusto to come over to both of them and be like, yo, what is wrong with you idiots right now? Be happy for the team. Like, they shot over to Potch while this was happening, Dan, and the camera, he had his arms crossed, and he did one of the, like, it, I, I could only describe it as, like, a you going to learn today dad face. Uh, like, I can't imagine the uh, strict talking to that was given to everybody after the match because his point is right. Like, this is one of the few moments of fucking joy you have this season. And your selfishness and your own individuality is going to threaten that moment. Like what if, what if we missed the penalty because of the shenanigans? Like we've seen dumber things like that derail a game for us. Right. Like, sure. And I think this, the quote is good, but I also like put a ton of this on Potch because he should have commanded this much earlier than April 15th, 2024. Like be real about that. I, I think, I think, the players have to grow up and this is a clear moment for them to grow up and be accountable and be a part of a team. And the manager has to command that before today. I think the context that was maybe missing at the moment for the other players as well. And, and maybe they do or don't know this, right? They don't know that Cole Palmer with his hat trick, right? Equals Ollie Watkins in total Premier League goals for the season gets the penalty is now tied with Erling Holland for Premier League goals this season. Say that again, Dan. <laughs> Say it again right now. Cole Palmer is tied with Erling Holland at the top of the Golden Boot race in the Premier League at 20 goals. That's outstanding. Like, do you can you have comprehended that at the beginning of the season that we would be in April and Chelsea would have a leader for the Golden Boot? Like, and it would have been Cole Palmer. Because I think yeah. all of us are like, oh, it's going to be in Kunku, right? He's going to come in. He's going to score 20 goals. It's going to be great. No, it's Cole fucking Palmer. I, I just, it is, it's unbelievable to to think about that. And, and again, like stupidity aside, it, it just looked embarrassing for us as a club. <laughs> like, I, I really hope these guys get their shit together. I'm all for a really competitive team that really wants to, you know, everyone wants to one up each other in service of, the team result. I am not for your Ronaldo sulking. If they don't get their way, blah, 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 bullshit. That is not the way that Chelsea football club plays ever. Like that is just, there has to be a line very clearly. And I would imagine there are a couple of guys going to be doing an excess amount of running in training tomorrow that will hopefully make that point very clear that not for the first time this year, we embarrassed ourselves, and hopefully that situation does not happen again. Well, let's talk about brighter things, and that first one is going to be the heat map of Moises Caicedo on the night, who, as he continues to walk the tightrope of not picking up a caution to avoid a suspension before the end of the season, does it again! And manages to <laughs> make it 86... He can't keep getting away with it, Dan. He can't keep getting away with it. 86 touches on the night, 84% accurate passes, one key pass. He had two out of three successful dribbles, 10 out of 16 ground duels, one. He lost possession 13 times. That's kind of normal, I think. But in general, four interceptions. He had five tackles, one block shot. He, in that pivot with Gallagher, who we'll talk about as well, they looked like a really, really good pairing together. They did. Um, I it, it's just a more physical pairing, and and I thought you know early on it was so obvious how much freedom Caicedo felt like he could play with in this game. He was all over the place. He was dynamic. He was dribbling uh, Everton players left and right. He was advancing the ball up the field. He was playing great plat playing great passes. This is much more the guy that we saw at Brighton last year than the guy we've seen at Chelsea this year, and it's because I. Th I think, and this is me being an amateur analyst here, but I think it's because he knew he had a real athlete next to him in Connor Gallagher who could cover off on the space and behind if it, you know, if there was a turnover in midfield. 
to, to Enzo's credit and discredit, he's just not the same sort of athlete that Connor is or that Caicedo is. He's a different sort of athlete. He's a really good athlete. Uh, he knows how to manipulate the ball in ways that those two could pro- only dream of. But in this situation, with when you need a midfield pairing to basically secure a, let's be honest, pretty shaky back line uh, over the last four months and advance the ball up the field to your dynamic attacking four with Mudrick and Mataweke and Palmer for, I think, only the second time that combination has been out there this year. You need stability, and they provided stability, and they worked incredibly well together. And this Caicedo performance, I was I was wondering about him for a little bit because I, I haven't seen the greatness that I expected. This made me go, oh, yeah, that guy's really good. <laughs> Yeah, it was nice to see when you take Connor's heat map and you take Moises Caicedo's heat map and when you overlap them with another, one another, there are areas where like the, the highlight is the same, right? Where you would expect, you know, in front of the R15 yard box, you know, there's plenty of space there that they were kind of occupying together. But the way that they didn't fully overlap, right? It wasn't like a Venn diagram where basically it's almost an overlapping circle, uh, one circle. It, they definitely had areas where they were operating independently. They were getting involved. Caicedo a little bit more further forward, particularly on the right-hand side of the pitch. And then you saw Gallagher with some forward, but he really stayed home and tried to make it so that there, if there was going to be an opportunity to need to recycle, be the connection with our back line, with our fullbacks, that he was really, really diligent on the night. And there were a couple of players, right, like that on the Everton side, I mean, Beto didn't necessarily get a lot done, but he was annoying at he times. Annoying. And so, you know, for our midfield players and our defenders, you know, again, who have struggled to do something called get a clean sheet, this is a recognition of the defenders and our midfielders in particular. Like, they help make that happen, right? Jackson, um, Jackson, Palmer, others made the goals happen and got us excited. But I think some of us were just as excited that we got our first clean sheet since January. Very, very me. excited. Me. That was me. I, I said at halftime in all caps, I want a clean sheet. That is, I was desperate for a clean sheet. And yeah, I mean, to transition to Connor, I mean, I this is not his like favored position being in the midfield pivot. He can do it, obviously. And I thought he performed really admirably there. But this is not where he's been traditionally played this year. And I thought he looked great. I mean, he threw himself in the tackles and I think was our enforcer on the day. He was choked twice uh, by Amadou Onana. Of course, there was nothing given for that. Don't worry about it because choking is legal in the league. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but he just, you know, he just showed out tonight. And and again, I, there are a lot of Connor haters out there. I just don't understand it. I really don't because the stats are good. The performance looked good. The fact that he was the adult in the room when silliness was happening and he pushed away uh, two guys who I think were desperate for that moment. And both of them, I think were a little bigger than he was. And he just was having none of it like that. That dude has grown so much this year. I am absolutely so proud that Connor Gallagher plays for this team and, you know, go through the stats, but the eye test was, was epic. Eye test was good. The stats, bear out that it was a good night for him. He was 65 of, out of 70, 93% pass accuracy, two key passes. He had four out of four successful dribbles, attempts and dribbles, 13 out of 16 ground duels, one, three out of four aerial duels, one. He had was fouled eight times on the night and also secured four clearances for the team too as we shut it down. But in general, really good night, good night for Connor. It's one of those things we're going to get to the end of the season. And if... If it happens that Chelsea were to sell him, you're selling someone who is absolutely on the upward trajectory within how he contributes and with how he plays at the moment. Yeah, and our, our friends at the fan cast have put together a sell Connor. We riot t-shirt hard to argue with that one, man. I, I absolutely love Connor Gallagher. I think he is, he's just, and he's just, is an emblematic emblematic. I should say, I can't say words today emblematic of everything that is good about this team. 
and the fighting character that is required for a team to compete for European places. And some of that stuff does still show up on the stat sheet. Obviously, it's read some of it. Some of it is intangible, and the intangibles have been lacking so severely at this team all season. And you got a guy with it in spades, man. Just use him properly. Well, we're going to take our last ad break. When we get back, we're going to talk about Nico Jackson and a beautiful goal that he secured. Alfie Gilchrist having a moment to remember and then taking a little bit of umbrage with how Pochettino used his subs and maybe slighted the academy just a touch. But stay tuned. We will be right back. All right, Nick. So we did say some unkind things about Nico earlier, but I have to say that goal that was a phenomenal goal that he scored. You know, he, we've, he's gotten a lot of flack, I think, this season for his decision making, some of the extra touches. This was one where the control of the cross in, the quick twist and turn to set himself up to take the shot, brilliantly executed, embarrassing Jordan Pickford for another time on the night, <laughs> to, to everyone's delight, including Brandon, who's not here. And ultimately did a good job kind of securing the the assist as well like he just was involved and is again not the prototypical striker and i think that's kind of where we might land this summer right maybe he becomes a, a left winger maybe he's a bit of a second striker maybe we tool around with the offense a little bit but to think back to this summer to now and to see where cole palmer has come from and where he is now, and to see where Nico Jackson has come from, where he is now, there is growth within these players. And I don't, I don't know how much credit I give to the institution and how much to the players and their individual drive, desire, and resolve, but Nico Jackson had a really strong, really solid performance on the night. And, you know, look, with his goal and assist, he's at 14 league goal contributions this season. It's only two off of the amount he had in La Liga last season. So he is definitely, definitely in upgrading to a more difficult league with the challenges of playing for Chelsea, with the early hole that he dug himself with some of the cautions, he is rounding out and getting ready, I think, to end this season where we would have hoped he would have been and still has a pathway with 14 league goal contributions. I mean, with you know several matches left to play, seven matches left to play, I mean, not outside the realm of possibility that he could be in that 16, 17, 18 range and be very close to 20 in the league. That's a really, really strong first season. Yeah, I mean, the goal was fantastic. It, it kind of was Giroud-esque in its simplicity and beauty. I just, I thought it was an excellent take. It might be his best goal of the season. Um, and that that is, you know, not light work. I mean, you add the four goal contributions from the FA cup and EFL cup, and he's at 18 goal contributions, all comps. That's not too shabby. I mean, you know, if, if it weren't for, uh, an excellent season from Cole Palmer, who is just off the rails right now from a goal contribution standpoint, he would I think, easily be our leader in the clubhouse. And you need multiple people who are going to get 10, 12, 14 goal contributions, you get them from everywhere and it makes goal scoring less of a burden and more fun. And yeah, I, th I think he's just been, he's been growing so much this year. I think we may look back on Nkunku getting injured this season as uh, not a blessing, but as a moment for Nico Jackson to have a full season where he's basically guaranteed to be the starter. because we didn't have anybody else. And he has used that time very effectively. I don't think it can be stated any other way. Now, do I love the antics? Do I love the yellow cards? And, and the fact that he has also stayed <laughs> free of another yellow card, which I, I, if you would have given me money, I wouldn't have put it on that um, when he got his ninth. I mean, it's pretty impressive stuff. I mean, if he does get a, a few more goals, if he gets up to like 17, 18 goal contributions in the league, gets over that 20 mark for the season, all comps. I mean, no, nobody would have said 20 at the start of the season. I think we all said 15 would be the high water mark, and he's already passed it. Yeah, when you look at it, he's actually at 18 all comps right now. Yep. 
So very, very close to hitting that 20 number for all competitions. I think the other thing to consider is, I mean, so he was out for AFCON, right? So he lost matches mm-hmm. that he could have played in this season. He's made 30 starts, 35 total appearances on the year, just under, just actually just above rather 2,700 minutes for the season. I mean, and not necessarily performing at the same volume he was at 0.79 goal plus assist minus pks last season and he had a very tight end run for villarreal last season and has got an opportunity to figure out how to more be the guy at chelsea rather than be one of the guys and to get it figured out and so i'm just loving it i'm loving where he's at i'm loving where he's going i think it's gonna make things interesting as we think about who Chelsea might go into the market for this summer. What type of profile of player are we going to be looking for? A lot of questions to answer. One question we don't have to answer though, was how much did Alfie Gilchrist enjoy celebrating his first senior goal at Stanford bridge? Nick, you got to give me your, your run through on the celly. Give me the grade on the celly. Cause the celly was, I think epic. It was an explosion of energy. He didn't even know what to do. He went through eight different celebrations before he reached the fans. Like he did a terrible knee slide. He has to work on the knee slide because he like popped up right away. And then he was he went over the fans. He didn't know who to hug. He was like, hey, "I'm gonna hug you first, and then I'll be over here." And then I, I think I think it was just in a match that was a beautiful match to watch. This is my favorite moment of the entire match by a mile because everyone in the stadium was so hyped for him. His teammates were so hyped for him. After we saw a moment of individuality around the penalty, you saw everyone coalesce around this kid. Everyone, like Ben Chilwell gave him a headlock because he's the one who kind of, it wasn't a pure assist because Pickford kind of put it right in his path. But like you saw everybody go over to him. And and I just, man, I... I love these moments so much. I love when our own Academy players break through. And by the way, it's a great fucking goal. It's a really hard goal to get right. We've seen our players sky those into the stands. How many times this season? Little half volley. He waited for it. Like the snow slow mo replay is great because he was super patient. I know he wanted to go for it earlier. He was busting at the seams to get there. And he just, his foot went down on the ball, controlled it near post. Pickford embarrassed yet again, collides into his own player. And man, I just, I I know everyone is so hyped for him and he's not put a foot wrong this year. Whenever he's played, what are you going to do? Yeah, I think we've been calling to see more of Alfie Gilchrist over the last month and a half as there've been injuries mounting, as there's been a need for players to get rest so that they can Mm -hmm. be their best in the matches. And this is what a little trust will do for you in the players that we have, the players that have been graduated through the academy. I think many people will say that Alfie Gilchrist is a very strong individual, developed a Cobham. But I think there's also not a lot of people say like that he is the best center back that we've ever created at Cobham. There's a lot of people who maybe are higher up on that rung. But this is the example of you get an opportunity, you're taking the opportunity. It helped earn him his contract extension it will potentially if he's getting these opportunities between now and the end of the season if he does end up going on loan which was the reporting as of the contract extension might earn him a better loan next season where he gets an opportunity to really develop and potentially come back in a another season a much more experienced versatile player who can can fully contribute for the entirety of a premier league campaign but for minor cameos to come up big like this, particularly with the movement into the box to pull up on his run just enough to get himself in the right space, to not really draw the attention of a defender, great game awareness in the moment executed perfectly. But I think Nick, this tees into the point that you wanted to make just around Pochettino's use of the Academy, continuing to bring some of these youngsters onto the bench to go and give minutes. I think some you could argue for players that need to get back into fitness in areas of positions where maybe we don't want Mark Kukure to be playing. We'd love to have Ben Chilwell back in the lineup and you need to get him back into game mode, but others where maybe you could have given one or two of these other players, these other youngsters an opportunity on the night. No doubt about it. I mean, 
at halftime, why don't we see Alfie, Alfie Gilchrist come in? We know Malaguso has been kind of going through it. He grabbed his hamstring again in the second half. That's not a player you can afford to lose for the run-in. Why isn't Alfie given a, a whole half of football? Give Malo the rest of the night off. He's done his job. We have four goals at half. What are you doing? How? And I say this because in the press conference on Friday before this game, he said, we will try and be competitive and win the game on Monday. We need to accept, be positive, and train with the young guys from the academy. They might step up, and the players that we didn't count on could surprise us and be good players and profiles for Chelsea. When this type of situation happens, another door opens. Then, what, Alfie gets eight cameo minutes? I mean, yeah, cool. Chukameka gets, just going back up to the, the stat box here, Chukameka gets... 28 minutes, something like that. Chilwell gets, you know, plus stoppage time, 15 minutes. Cassidy, another player who could have come in for Jackson after the shenanigans, gets 12, 15 minutes. Oh, Gilchrist came in at the 88th minute, so he only got about, yeah, I think eight total minutes. Washington, another player who could have come in much, much earlier. Dyer and George there for the for available. Like, if you're going to play Chilwell at wing, why don't you just throw George in? At left back, let him go. I mean, Everton were doing shit the whole second half. Like, so you either say this and mean it, or you don't. And if you don't mean it, then don't fucking say it. I mean, this is, I think the the frustrating part. And I'm not, I'm not Chelsea youth on on the academy agenda, but I do think in a time where your squad has two incredibly important games coming up, City in the FA Cup semi and Arsenal away. These are the next two fucking games. You cannot afford to lose more players, more important players for grown up games like those. You are up four nil at half. You have won the game conclusively. It's over. No one, even with our defense, no one's scoring four. So, what are you doing, man? I, I love it, Nick Verlaney. What are you doing to talk about just things that are odd and peculiar? Things that, and this is maybe a, the wrong way to look at it, but I, I think we as supporters have been looking for ways and looking for signs from Mauricio Pochettino that he gets us, that he gets Chelsea, that he understands what this club means. We've seen flashes. We've not seen a consistent, sustained connection between the supporters and the manager. And not necessarily to say that you have to have that to create a winning culture and an identity. Like there've been mercenaries who come in and get the job done and they go and you, maybe you didn't have a connection with them, but look, Hey, Marisa, sorry, won a trophy with Chelsea. As much as there was no connection, he went out, got the business done and we say, thank you. He says, thank you. And we go on our separate ways. Things like finding an opportunity to create this connection, create a pathway for players. And look, I hate giving Jurgen Klopp any type of praise, but he does it on the regular. And he does it in very, very important games. And I mean, again, I hate, I absolutely hate that I'm saying this, but like that is something that would show the players that there's a pathway. It shows the individuals at the younger levels of the academy, right? The U15s, the U16s, the U17s who won, won their, 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 their league as well. So, like, I mean, ultimately, like, there's a lot of good things going on in the younger levels that people are not necessarily aware of that you would hope he would find opportunities at times like this with how bad things have gotten at points in this season to create more positivity. And this night in the whole is still a plus positive is still one of the best oh. matches we've played in recent history. We are nitpicking if only to say, how could we get some cherries on top of this Sunday? Well, I, I just, if he mentions the injury situation, you know, let's pretend the Malagusta is not ready to go on Saturday. Buddy, that's on you. <laughs> you could have rested him. No doubt about it. Like if he, you know, yeah, we need to beat Everton, but we could have beat Everton tonight with Alfie Gof El Alfie Gilchrist at right back. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like, I just I don't want to hear any complaints when you won't do the simple shit to make the situation better. 
this is where you lose me. Like I, I can appreciate the injury situation and I am empathetic as hell to that because we've seen the injury bench just get longer and longer and longer and longer and re injuries and training injuries and international break injuries and all the things that have, that have happened to us. But bro, you're up four nil at half. Make all five subs at half and just roll with it into Saturday. Take all the momentum in the world into Saturday, knowing that Malagusa doesn't have to bomb up and down the wing for another 40 minutes. You know, take the dub. I agree. So let's talk about how the European dream is still alive, Nick. Because again, this is the latest turning point in a season of turning points. Chelsea God. facing. I hate the- no, no turning point. We are not Looking at a turning point, Dan. Up Every again. time we've said we are, it goes the other way. So just say we're just we're never there. We we don't even have a chance at Europe. Maybe they'll show up. Who knows? Another chance to look up and see that it is not insurmountable that you could absolutely reach up and climb above the teams ahead of you in the table. Chelsea, three points off of sixth place. There are three teams currently ahead of us. We are in ninth place still, so there's no movement in our position, but there were some important matches over the weekend that went our way. Newcastle currently sitting on six, 50 points, plus 17 goal difference. Their remaining fixture list, Palace away, Sheffield, Burnley away, Brighton, United away, Brentford away, Tottenham. Not necessarily pretty, an pretty easy. easy run. Yeah, it's an easy run. It's about but as easy a run as there is. Favorable. Man United somehow continue to be one of the luckiest teams I have ever seen in a Premier League season in seventh place on 50 points with a negative one goal difference. They have Sheffield United. They have Burnley. They have Palace away. They have Arsenal, Newcastle, Brighton to end the season. Those last three matches, not very kind to Manchester United. Tough. And Palace are playing better now. I should say that. Palace got something done this weekend. We appreciate it. West Ham, eighth place, have played 33 games. They have played two more matches than Chelsea at 48 points. They have a negative six goal difference. Their remaining fixture list, boy, oh boy, you do not want to be West Ham. Crystal Palace, Liverpool away, Chelsea away, Luton, and Man City away. So at least at least two uh, losses on there. <laughs> at Palace and Liverpool, everybody else is up, up for debate. <laughs> That West Ham game, I'm telling you, I think that West Ham game is, is as you go through our schedule, possibly the most important one of the bunch. For Chelsea, we have, as you mentioned earlier, Arsenal away as our next fixture, the reschedule. We have Villa away. We have Tottenham, West Ham. And then you have Nottingham Forest away, Brighton away, and Bournemouth. So we are in, I would say, the gauntlet phase of yes. our run into the end of the season. There is light at the end of the tunnel, but getting something out of these next three matches, particularly the next four, if you had West Ham, are so critical to potentially keep this dream alive, to try to make a push for sixth place. And it is, I think, this point going to require some luck. It's going to require Newcastle getting bogeyed a little bit by one or more of these teams. But Chelsea have the opportunity. It's not out of the realm of possibility. It's not mathematically eliminated as an idea that Chelsea could get up to and get into sixth position. So I think that is the thing that just from a context standpoint, Nick, I want to put out in the end of the world. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I am definitely just postulating that it could happen if some circumstances go our way. We take care of our business. And maybe one or two of the balls fall the other way this time for Manchester United. We might be able to make it six. Well, Dan, if we would have beaten 19th place Burnley and 20th place Sheffield, we'd already be in sixth place. Um, yep. And and then and then the math becomes a little easier to stomach uh, as you look at the remaining fixtures because we already went through the cream puff uh, phase of our season, and and now we're at some of the hard bits, the rescheduled bits, the we're still in uh, the FA Cup bits, and that's uh, that's not the case for your Arsenal's of the world. Uh, or your villas of the world or anything like that. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be difficult. I mean, look, I, even to get a point against Arsenal would be so fun. <laughs> Anything to be uh, a part of the collapse uh, of their title campaign. It give it to me. It would be so fun. It would be uh, just, uh, 
I, damn, I really want that. Villa obviously are going to be difficult. They look like they've kind of found a, a second win this season. They they pummeled Arsenal. It was great to watch. Tottenham are all over the place right now. They play great one week. They play terrible the next. You have no earthly idea. I could not believe Newcastle dismantled them so easily. I mean, it was insane to watch. Uh, West Ham are pretty bad right now, just being honest. I think Bowen's injured or is coming back from injury, maybe not full strength. So that's that's their scoring done right there. Uh, Forest are a mess, which means inevitably we're going to struggle with them. Uh, Brighton will be on the beach by then. Bournemouth will be on the beach by then. So we'll see. I mean, like I said, not impossible. We haven't lost in eight in the league, which is part of the reason why we've advanced from our downward trodden 11th all the way up to ninth. <laughs> um, but you know, we, we got it. We got to take care of business. We got to play more consistent. And if they do, I have no doubt we'll, we'll climb up there. New, I mean, Newcastle, for all of their, you know, momentum right now are, are not impervious by any means. I mean, they're, they're all over the place too. They have a ton of injuries. So I, it's possible if we play really well and everyone else plays to their normal standard, I have no doubt we'll be in and around that, but that is asking a lot of us. Well, as we look at how the weekend went for the other teams and where the table is at now, didn't bother running a day in the match. It was Cole Palmer, done and dusted. Yeah. So we just went forward with that. But the results this weekend, as you alluded to, Newcastle beat Tottenham 4 nothing. Brentford beat Sheffield 2 nothing. Burnley and Brighton drew. So I guess we're not the only team to draw with the relegation favorites of Burnley. Man City busted up on Luton 5-1. to one. Forest Wolves 2-2. Two, two. You had Bournemouth Man United 2-2. Two, two. You had Crystal Palace with the shock result of the weekend, one nothing over Liverpool. To everyone's delight. And check everybody in my liked veins. that. Oh, how glorious. That was the start of Saturday. And I was like, man, maybe Saturday is gonna be all right. <laughs> You had Fulham beating West Ham 2 nothing. We appreciate that. And then Aston Villa doing the work, making sure to pull Arsenal back down a little closer to their level to nothing. It was an absolutely good evening after that one. And then we finished <laughs> it off with the 6 0 result. That means, Nick, Man City, to no one's surprise, back in first place in the league. 73 points on 32 matches played. Arsenal behind them in 71 points. Liverpool in third, also on 71 points. And then you have Aston Villa rounding out the top four in 63 points. With Tottenham not far behind and a match in hand with 60 points. And as you talked about earlier, it's Newcastle and Man United both on 50 points. 48 points for West Ham in eighth. Chelsea sitting in ninth at 47 points. And we do have the benefit of having one less game played against Newcastle and Man United and two games less than West Ham. Dan, I, I had heard somewhere that it just meant more to Liverpool, though. Um, <laughs> did, what, but what happened? I, did, did, did Eze say no? I, I think it means more to me personally. Or I, I heard that Anfield was a place where you simply can't win. Is this? I'm confused, Dan. I, I, it's a, it's, I, it's a media, marketing tie-in with uh, the new Ghostbusters movie. It's uh, the ghost of Roy Hodgson. We, we not soon forgotten as a managerial posting at Crystal Palace. The, the the look. The media has told me all season that it just means more. That Jurgen Klopp is unbelievable. Hmm. Fascinating. Uh, also. <laughs> Unai Emery doing that to Arsenal is just mm, chef's yeah. kiss of a lifetime. Just wonder. He had to feel so fucking good after that game. Like just, oh, he had to go into the locker room like that Roy Williams, North Carolina bit where he's like <laughs> dancing in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it was outside of, of Newcastle just dusting Tottenham, which for me is hilarious and banter and fun anyway. It was a perfect weekend of results for us. On the opposite end of the table, Sheffield United continue to be at the bottom on their historically bad campaign. Uh, thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, 16 points. You have Burnley in 19th on 20 points. You have Luton in 18th on 25 points, but not so fast. 
You have Nottingham Forest on 26 points, and then you have Everton, who do have a game on hand on everyone except Sheffield United, who are also on 32 played at 27 points. And they there has been an update that they are fast tracking their profit and sustainability reporting plus the Premier League's ruling on whether or not they violated to the extent, because those two points are absolutely massive right now. Critical. Because that would take them up to 29. They'd be three points ahead, and they would feel a little bit safer as to where they are right now. But boy, oh boy, very interesting times. You could see this coming down to the last game of the season for one of these teams, and it is going to be absolute pandemonium. Yeah, I mean, I, I think personally, I think f- I think Luton just pips Forrest and Forrest goes down. Uh, but I mean, Everton are sinking right now. I mean, they're since since they beat us at Goodison, they've been atrocious. They've been on one of the worst teams in the league. And of course, you take away, I think, what is it? Ten total points between the two deductions. Or is it eight? I forgot they got them reduced they got the first one reduced from 10 to 6 maybe anyway let's just say they would be much higher up the table they would be an absolute safety land and they'd be somewhere in the mid 30s which would put them like up into 14th place yeah they they would be clear but basically everyone from brentford up in 15th is safe now i mean thanks to burnley and sheffield united absolutely shitting the bet all season except against us of course um cool stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think the lesson is, uh, you have to handle your business against these teams. We finally did it. Um, I wish we would have saved a couple of those goals for the other games, but, um, here we are. And, uh, Chelsea could hypothetically move up the table and be on 50 points if everyone else shits the bed. So we'll see. Crazy times to think that we could ascend beyond ninth place and make it up to six. But look, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer for that because it's a match against Manchester City this weekend in the FA Cup semifinals that we are looking forward to. And boy, oh boy, it would be nice to just give Man City one less thing to worry about and to really make sure that they can focus on the league. This is really, this is helping Pep out. Let's help them focus, Dan. That's all I'm asking. It's like, let's. Coventry are going to dust United. We all know that. That's gonna. That's gonna be an easy. That's light work for Coventry. We know this. Yeah. But man, I think I think the league would appreciate it if we just help them hone in a little bit more. Right. They already have the Champions League, and they're they're in a real battle against Madrid. There. Just guys, take a load off. Go focus on on winning this thing now because uh, if. It looks like they are in run-in city mode where they're just going to start destroying people per usual. Yeah. And <laughs> and that's going to be a tough look for uh, for it means more Liverpool and we're back Arsenal. That's going to be tough. Well, that is going to do it for this episode. Plenty more content coming your way this week from the London is a blue community of content creators. But that's going to do it for this episode. We're going to take a beat now. We're going to get a chance to just enjoy that 6-0 victory for a little bit longer, a few more days before the weekend hits us and it's a FA Cup semifinal match that we have to focus on. But you know what to do until next time, Chelsea fans. Keep the blue flag flying high. <laughs>